All right, hi everybody. My name is David Vernet. I'm a kernel engineer at Meta, and I'm gonna be talking about a new project that just got merged into the kernel uh, called Skedex. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. This is the agenda. Um, the majority of the presentation is actually gonna be number three. Um, as I was gonna say, I did a talk last year uh, already on Skedex at Kernel Recipes. That talk was really focused on Skedex itself, how to build schedulers in Skedex, the motivation behind the project, that kind of thing. Um, if you want to know how to build schedulers in Skedex, I would recommend re uh, watching this, going to that presentation. We're going to be talking a lot more about scheduling at kind of a higher level and looking at some like real-world case studies uh, today. So hopefully it'll be fun. Um, to start with, let's talk about what a CPU scheduler is, for those of you who may not know. It's pretty simple. It's the component of the system that decides which threads get to run where and when do they get to run. You have multiple cores, you have multiple threads, the scheduler decides you get to run on CPU zero, you get to run on CPU two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, conceptually, it's simple. Obviously, it's extremely complicated, not simple at all. Uh, schedulers have to worry about fairness. So um, everybody should get some proportion of CPU. The scheduler has to make optimal scheduling decisions. So if you run a thread on CPU zero, it might've been a better idea to run it on CPU two for better cache locality, for example, or maybe one of the threads uh, needed the CPU before the other one. Um, the scheduler has to have low overhead, so the scheduler can't spend a ton of time um, making a decision. It has to be quick uh, so that it doesn't take up too much time. And then in general, not always, but in general, you want it to be generalizable. So the policy that you choose, you want it to apply on multiple architectures for multiple workloads. Um, and so those are some of the challenges uh, which make it difficult. Now, Skedex, um, like I said, it's a new project that lets you implement host-wide CPU scheduling policies as BPF programs. Um, so for those of you who don't know what BPF is, it's essentially a JIT that runs in the kernel that lets you safely run code. There's a static analyzer that looks at your, your program when you're loading it, verifies it's safe, loads it, and then you go off and, and you, you run your program. So you can write a whole CPU scheduling policy with this uh, BPF technology. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, one of the biggest reasons was for quick experimentation. Uh, with a scheduler, it's kind of a pain to do to do experiments because you change the kernel, you recompile the kernel, you reinstall it, you reboot your host, you warm your caches up, and then you can you can run your scheduler, right? You can't really do like performance experiments in a VM unless you're testing like a hypervisor or something like that. Um, so with this, all you do is recompile your BPF program, load it into the kernel, and boom, you're running the new scheduler. There's nothing else you need to do. Um, it's also safe. So if you have a buggy scheduler. BPF will either reject it outright if it could crash the kernel, or if uh, you have like a bad scheduler that like hangs a task or something like that, we'll also kick you out and revert back to uh, the default scheduler. Um, another thing you can do with this is bespoke scheduling policies. Um, so for example, in, at uh, Meta, we're running on millions of hosts, I think, at this point. Um, and so we have a scheduler called SCX Layered that lets you specify a JSON file, um, which dictates the, the scheduling policy. So like prioritize this C group, um, preempt, this C group should always preempt other C groups, that kind of thing. And that obviously gets us some pretty good wins. Google's seen uh, good, good results on, uh, on search as well. So, you know, you, you don't want to have like a scheduler that's not generalizable be merged into the kernel, but sometimes if you get huge wins, it can be nice to have as well. Uh, another nice, uh, nice thing you can do is move complexity into user space. So BPF uh, is an ecosystem. So you run code in the kernel, it's a kernel technology, but BPF also has uh, maps that let you basically share data structures between the uh, kernel space and user space. So for example, you could have uh, user space do something, communicate its intention to the kernel via one of these maps, and then the kernel applies the policy um, when you're making a scheduling decision. Um, we'll talk about some technologies that exist, like a SCX RustLand that lets you actually build a whole scheduler in user space, which is awesome. Okay, so speed run through why we did this and what schedulers are, because I want to get to the fun stuff. But before we get to the fun stuff, uh, just again, you know, last year's talk goes really deep into the APIs and sort of the, the interfaces that Skedex provides to you to write schedulers. So go check that out. But we, we still want to take like a basic look at what we're dealing with so that we have the context. Um, and like you may expect, when you're implementing an interface, you're implementing a set of callbacks. Uh, that's what the core schedulers do in the kernel. It's the same with Skedex. For example, we have the select CPU callback here, where that's invoked when a task wakes up, um, and the scheduler can dictate which CPU the task should be migrated to at wake up, so that then you can you can schedule the task directly on the CPU, and you don't have to do any kind of like run queue. Uh, lock balancing. So it's a little bit of an optimization. And there's a whole bunch of callbacks. There's like C group callbacks and, and a task lifecycle callbacks, which we're not showing here. Um, but if you go to the link here and uh, you're curious, you can see you can see all of them in the code. 
so since uh, since last year, a lot of stuff has landed, um, both in the kernel and in the, the schedulers themselves. Um, one of them is CPU frequency integration. So uh, just like the other schedulers, SCEDEX interfaces with SCEDUtil to communicate to the CPU frequency governor as to how we should scale the, uh, the CPU. Um, we wanted to do that so that it was cross-architecture and you didn't have to you know, have an API that was that was specific to an architecture. So these are the K funks, the ones that are in teletype here that you can use. This one at the top lets you uh, basically scale the priority, scale the load of a single CPU so that SCEDUtil communicates more or less load depending on the, uh, the priority or the frequency that you want to set. And then there's some other ones that let you query like the current uh, the current um, performance level, the capacity, so you can basically do like per entity load tracking and scale by frequency like the core kernel does as well. Um, some other kind of nifty stuff, uh, you can iterate now over dispatch queues, also discussed last year, but as a very quick overview, a dispatch queue is just a data structure that the, the kernel provides to these schedulers that basically are like a FIFO queue or a VTime queue for scheduling tasks. You can now iterate over them and select which tasks you want to run. Um, and then you can do other stuff that's kind of like an implementation detail like direct dispatch, which uh, again, I won't go into too much today. Um, also, the schedulers that we've built have had a lot of improvements. Um, my favorite one is SCX Rusty. Uh, it's it's a, a load balancing scheduler with a Rust uh, load user space Rust load balancing component, um, and it's also gotten much better for interactivity. So we'll see a case study today about about why it's better and how it how it compares to the EVDF. Um, SCX LAVD is a scheduler written by uh, Chung Wu Min at Egalia. Um, and so this is actually soon going to be running as the default scheduler on the Steam Deck, which is super, super exciting. Um, there's all sorts of awesome uh, features in the scheduler, like there's a performance mode where you, you want to maximize FPS and, and keep jitter minimized, but then if you're low on battery, you can try to like more aggressively uh, pack tasks onto subsets of cores. Um, so super cool stuff. And then SCX Rustland, that was written by Andrea, who did his presentation yesterday. And uh, that lets you build um, an entire scheduler in user space by implementing his interface. Uh, and it actually runs really well in a lot of workloads. Um, and it's, it's gotten even better. There's a lot of hot path stuff that now happens in VPF. So um, it's a great way to get, get started with the project as well. OK, fun stuff. So <laughs> Linux gaming under pressure. So um, what I want to talk about is, is why schedulers are super important for interactivity and for Linux gaming in particular, talk about sort of what these workloads are doing, and then we'll look at what the scheduler is doing to either totally drop the ball or to, to make it so that you don't notice that anything bad's going on. So the first thing to understand is that interactive workloads, interactive being like you're interfacing with your desktop, you're listening to music, like you as a human is, are interacting with your machine, they're very cyclic, right? Like if you're, you're playing a game, there's a frame that renders, you do some work to render the frame, the game is deciding which objects have to go where, that eventually, the game eventually communicates your intention to some other component, the compositor, which is going to render the scene, and then boom, you render it. And then you start over again at the next cycle. So it's 100% it's, it's cyclic. Um, it's, uh, for desktop gaming, it's, it's a little bit different than for other like immersive environments like VR, but conceptually speaking, everything is cyclic at the end of the day. So um, I'm going to show you, I hope this works actually. Uh, that would, that would be unfortunate if we couldn't watch these videos. Here, let's see. Cool, Google bug. So this is just an example of Terraria on an idle system. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be winning any esports competition, so let's just ignore how bad I am at this game. But you're walking around, you're punching slime things in the face, and you're getting destroyed uh, by those slime things because you're bad at easy mode. Um, I'm sorry that it's dark. I recorded this at night, and the game makes it render at night if you do it at night, so that's my bad. But as you can see, this is a trace of what the game looks like, what the, what the host is doing while you're running the game. And it's really clear that there's a lot of, of, uh, of cyclic activity, right? Like if we go back here, there's tons of white space and you can see vertically like the work is happening at a very consistent cadence. Um, in fact, if you look at exactly how long uh, it takes between those cadences, it's about 16 milliseconds and between like 300 to 700 microseconds. And the game's running at 60 FPS, so there you go, right? It's exactly as you'd expect. Um, here's a little bit of a closer view. We're going to look at this more closely, but you can see here it's almost exactly, I don't know if you can see that up there, but it's almost exactly 16.7. So let's actually take a look now at one of these traces um, so we can see what's going on. So this is Perfetto, so shout out to Google for building this tool. It's an awesome tool for, uh, for debugging scheduler problems. But like we saw, we have all of these cyclic things here, and these are all the, these are all frames that are running. And if we zoom in here, we can see that a frame starts with GNOME shell, 
okay, it's being woken up by Swapper, so it's probably like a timer that's going off. And then GNOME Shell will wake up another thread in the process, okay? And then that'll wake up the main thread again. And then you go up here, and GNOME's waking itself up, and da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. Then X Wayland comes into the picture. This is a K worker, I think, so we can ignore that. It's probably something else. But X Wayland comes in, and then X Wayland is doing its own pipeline wakeups. Um, and then finally, eventually, we get to the Terraria main thread, which actually starts running on CPU 31. So there's a migration. Okay, so Terraria main starts running. It runs for a little bit. Let's see what it's doing. Oh, so the migration task is running. So we know that it got migrated to a different CPU. So if we go up here, we see that it's here now. And then, okay, it starts to schedule all of these other worker threads, which are also Terraria threads, that are that are doing all the work for the frame in the game. So I have no idea what these threads are doing, right? They're probably like, one of these is probably like the monster, and one of the other ones is like the bird that was that was destroying me, whatever. I guess I'd be fine if those guys got throttled, but um, but that's that's what it's doing, right? It's, it's scheduling all these things, lots of stuff happening in parallel, um, and eventually those things are done running. Somebody schedules, uh, one of those worker threads schedules the Terraria main thread, and it runs for a while. Eventually it schedules X Wayland. So now Terraria is communicating its intention back to the compositor, saying, I know what I want to render, here you go. There's the X Wayland protocol, very similar to the X, X protocol for those of you who, are in, who, uh, who know about that stuff. They do a handshake, they go back and forth. We run for a little bit longer, and then eventually uh, we're done running. And we sit around doing nothing until the next frame starts and we do the same thing. Um, and so that's how games work, <laughs> if you've never, if never seen something like that before. So, all right, so obviously there are a few takeaways here, right? So one thing is that, like I said a million times, these are very periodic workloads. They're very predictable in many ways. Um, they're also very highly pipelined, right? So you have GNOME. GNOME wakes up Wayland. They wake each other up, and they're doing this, this handshake back and forth. They're running for really short amount of time, sometime like 10 microseconds, 30 microseconds. And then eventually, you wake up the game. It does a bunch of work. It does its handshake also with X Wayland, so the pipeline continues. And then as soon as that's over, everything goes quiet. So. Um, there are certain things you can you can look at and that are kind of interesting. Like the frame that we looked at was about four milliseconds, um, so that implies that the best you could probably ever do is about 250 FPS. Some of the other frames are a little bit longer, um, so you can kind of understand some qualities of your workload by looking at that. But that's that's you know that's interactivity. That's kind of what you're looking at generally. Now, in the example that we just looked at, um, the system was really idle. Obviously, right? We saw there was like tons of white space in the trace. The system is basically just waiting for work. Um, that's what you ideally want if you can, but of course that's not always how things can go. Whoops, sorry. Um, and even when the system is overcommitted, you have the same constraints, right? Like this is a periodic workload, and so if you don't do all of your work by the time GNOME is getting kicked off again by the timer, then you're not submitting a frame, and so nothing's going to happen. And that's that's where lag comes from in interactive workloads. So okay, obviously we're going to take a look at what happens if you do crazy overcommit. Now, the, the host that I tested all this on is a Ryzen 9 7950X. So there are um, 16 uh, physical cores and 32 CPUs on, uh, on the host. Um, I'm running an 8X CPU stressor workload, so 256 tasks that are always just chewing on the CPU and are always runnable are going to be running. So wildly overcommitted, right? Like not nearly enough CPU to run this stuff. Um, and just if you're interested, I'm using a distro called Cache OS, which is essentially just like a stock Arch Linux kernel on 6.11, but um, uh, but it has SCEDEX uh, support. So I like to give them my business. Uh, my business, I don't pay them, unfortunately. Um, OK, so let's take a look at what, what Terraria looks like when we're using EEVDF on this overcommit scenario. This is probably Google's lag. This isn't my fault. OK, there you go. All right. so. You know, you can see, I'm sorry, it's, can you see that at all? Ah, uh, no. No, huh? You can't? Yeah, sorry, that would be great. This is like the creme de la creme of the, the presentation, so if we can't see it, that would be really sad. The ones at the front specifically would be great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Oops, there we go. Can you turn the ones here off that are that are projecting onto the screen? This is my fault for doing the presentation at like 2 a.m. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so I know it's still dark, but can we kind of... See, okay, now it's actually off, but can we kind of see it? 
It's like, yeah, you see the lag. You see the jumps. Okay, good, good, good. That's what matters. You know, it's like slow compared to what was before, right? It's You can see the lag very clearly. Okay, good. All right, so this is what the trace looks like. Um, different than last time, right? Like these are stuffed full of colors of, of workers that are hogging everything. If you did like a make dash J 8x n proc, it would look something like this. You have GCC threads or, or Clang, whatever, that are that are chewing up the CPU. For a compile job, you'd have a lot more memory overhead as well because they're reading all these files into the page cache, but same idea here. Let's just assume that we're going to be CPU bound for this presentation. So yeah, right, 60 FPS is still the goal. Um, we see here, I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but we have about a 16.7 millisecond uh, window here. But unlike in bef uh, the example before, X Wayland, um, uh, yeah, 60 milliseconds for GNOME and X Wayland, but uh, the Terraria threads are consistently blocked now. So like, they're not done running, they're not doing anything, they're not communicating to X Wayland by the time GNOME is kicking off again. And that's why you see like slow things happening because eventually it sends over what it wanted, but the, the, the synchronicity of these frames just aren't, isn't happening, right? Um, and we can see this in a little bit more detail here. Um, like the Terraria main thread is blocked. Um, when GNOME is kicking off the new work, we see that the, the Terraria main thread is actually getting preempted by another thread in process, while all the rest of these, you know, 32 cores, 31 remaining cores are just running like matrix multiplication. Um, so, you know, we're not running for very long here, right? It was like four milliseconds end to end for the pipeline. So like, it would be great if we could just get that out of the way and then let everybody else do their thing and the system would be totally fine. So that's what we want. Um, yeah, and you know, stress is hogging the machine. We're not accounting for latency. Um, so I wanna, I wanna explain how we fix this, but before we do that, I think it's really important to take a look at schedulers kind of at a more fundamental level and especially in Linux and understand why was it designed this way? What is it really doing? And then we can kind of develop an intuition for why we see this lag and then what we can do to improve it. So CFS, I think until Linux 6.7 was the default scheduler in the kernel since for a long time, since like 2001 or something. Um, and now it's called EEVDF. And so Steven, thank you, helpfully gave a little bit of an overview of this earlier. We're gonna dive into some more detail. Um, so EEVDF is what's called a fair weighted V time scheduler. So conceptually speaking here, you have four tasks, they each get 25% of the system. It's fair, it's spreading the CPU out, right? Now, what does this really mean? Okay, so there's some math coming. This is really important to understand if you wanna understand how schedulers work, especially the one in Linux. It's not that complicated, but I don't want, like people's eyes glaze over when they see math. I'll explain all of it. It's, it's not a big deal, but I did wanna warn you. Okay, so this is the equation that drives basically most schedulers and definitely most of Linux. So, here we have the weight here. So every thread in Linux has a weight between one and 10,000. And the amount of CPU that you allocate to a thread is a function of its weight. And then how much other work, how many other threads in the system are running. And on the right side here, you have the inverse sum of every thread's weight in the system. And uh, then a the time interval that you're trying to determine how much CPU that it should get. And in a really simple example, um, let's say that we had two tasks with weight one each. Well the sum of inverse weights is one divided by one plus one, so half. They each have weight one, so that one on the left just becomes a one, and then boom, you end up getting the interval divided by two. They each get half of the CPU, right? Um, pretty simple stuff. That's that's like how fairness is designed and calculated in, in, uh, in Linux and in fair schedulers in general. Slightly more complicated example, but just as simple. Um, let's say that one of the two tasks is weight two, and the other one has weight one, so one of them has twice double the weight of the other, well, in, in, you know, intuitively, it should get twice as much CPU as the other one, right? It's twice as twice as uh, prioritized. Doesn't mean that it should always override the other one. It's not RT, right? But it should get twice as much bandwidth, twice as much CPU. And we see here, exactly as you'd expect, two times one over the sum. The sum is now three, because we have one plus two. And so see, uh, thread zero gets two thirds of the runtime, two thirds of that interval, and thread one gets one third. And so that's fairness. That's how Linux does scheduling. Now, in practice, one more thing that's really important to understand is this is implemented with something called vRuntime. And if we go back to this example, the way that you could that you could implement this is you count when somebody's running on a CPU, you track how long it ran for, and then you scale how long you account against the thread according to its weight. So if we have a weight of 100, then you just count the runtime as this is how long it ran for. If you had weight 200, then you'd be scaling by a half, and so you'd half how much time you accounted against the thread. And in doing that, 
like let's say that you ran for two milliseconds. I don't remember if I had an example here. I don't. If you ran for two milliseconds and two threads had the same weight, then they would each have a V runtime of one millisecond. And by counting it that way, you end up implementing this fairness equation, right? So I know it's a little bit complicated. I can explain that more if anybody was confused. But that's that's how scheduling works. That's fairness, and that's how that's how Linux implements it. So yeah, the default weight's 100. And so yeah, the bottom line is it's a weighted partitioning of the CPU. This is how schedulers do bandwidth allocation. This is how they divide CPU and give it out. Now, um, and the reason that it's an integral, by the way, is because in a perfect scheduler, like with zero overhead, then an integral would actually be the correct, perfectly fair way that you would divide it. But in practice, of course, we don't do that. OK, so V runtime is fine for, for bandwidth allocation, but it has no idea about latency, right? If you have two threads that, that both have the same V runtime, if one of them needs a CPU now and the other one doesn't, well, like the V runtime is just like choose either one. It doesn't matter. Like you're just trying to be fair. And so this, this is where deadline comes in. Deadline is about latency. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, EVDF as of Linux 6.7, that's the new scheduler. And the reason that this was implemented is because uh, it purports to improve latency while still providing fairness. And the way that it provides fairness is that it still uses V runtime, just like CFS, but then it adds a deadline that it calculates from the V runtime, and that's what you actually use to determine who gets to, to run next in the system. So CFS, it just chooses whoever deserves more CPU. You know, you've, you've run the least amount of time, it's your turn, but now you, can, you have a deadline that can be shifted according to the, the thread's latency priority, and that's what's used to actually determine who gets to run. It's still fair, right? Still V runtime, but now there's latency. Now, a little bit more math. This is a little, little more complicated. We'll explain it, it's fine. Um, yeah, so just be sorry. <laughs> okay, so on the left here, that's the deadline. That's what that's what we're calculating to determine which thread is supposed to run next. Now, this next piece is essentially just v runtime, right? Just counting how long each thread is run for. This is the bandwidth part of it. Steve mentioned that that EVDF has this thing called eligibility, which is what this actually is. Um, so this is a this is the v runtime where the thread would be eligible to run again. And again, eligibility is. You, get, you, you received more CPU than you were supposed to. You're not eligible to run. You were supposed to get five milliseconds. You got five and a half. So until your V runtime is at five and a half milliseconds, you're not allowed to run, even if your deadline is earlier. Um, and then the final piece is the request length. This is like the really important part, which is basically the slice length. So how long is the task given the CPU before you, you check to see if somebody else should give it? It's how long is your, your turn, essentially. And then you can inversely scale that by weight, just like you do with V runtime. So okay, uh, but basically, you know, you 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 do v runtime and then you scale the v runtime to get the deadline, and that's what you use for latency. Now that's fine. You know, it's a, it's an interesting idea. It makes sense in general. Virtual deadlines are great ideas. It totally makes sense. But EVDF does have some shortcomings, unfortunately. So first of all, deadline based on slice length is is a, is a little bit odd, right? Because how do you tune slice length for interactivity? Like I don't know. I work in schedulers all day. I have no idea how to tune slice length. The idea is that a shorter slice length. You get the CPU for less time. Your turns are, are shorter, but your deadline is earlier because the, the, the deadline is V runtime plus slice length, right? It's just really difficult to decide how to, how to balance that line. That's one problem, in my opinion. Um, the other thing is about, about EVDF that's a little bit odd, I think, is eligibility. Um, it does more fairly slice up the CPU because you could have a, a task with really short slice lengths that continuously just gets chosen because its deadline is super early, whereas a task with a really long uh, slice will will have to wait until like you know it's the slice length v runtime happens, uh, but but eligibility is not necessary for fairness. Um, I think it's necessary again for bounding lag or for like being uh, like uh, yeah just slicing up the CPU. But it's I, I haven't really wrapped my head around it, and it does also hurt interactivity because you're making those short slices less likely to run. So okay, what well, what can we do to improve? Right? I mean it's 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 a fine solution. It works really well in certain cases, but but can we do anything better? Um, so we still want to we still want to have like a virtual deadline, but now we can base our deadline on something dynamic that the scheduler itself can trace. And there's two things that happen to work, two of many, but two things that we know for sure happen to work very very well. And one is the scheduler tracks how long the task is actually running for. So instead of having the user set the slice length, the scheduler tracks the runtime and then determines the slice length from that. And the second thing is. Um, we can boost threads that we believe are part of work chains. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so a couple things. So first of all, kind of an interesting property about threads that's not universally true, but is generally true. If you block a lot, you're probably a consumer task because you're probably blocked on a few texts and you're waiting for somebody to tell you to do more work. 
If you wake other threads up a lot, you're probably a producer task because you're probably kicking a few texts and saying, go do work. If you have high frequencies of both being a block, being a waker or being a blocked thread, you're probably in the middle of a work chain because somebody kicked you and then you kick the person in front of you. Um, and so there's a really basic idea that was developed by Chang Wu, the SCX LAVD author at Egalia. Shout out to, to Egalia because they're doing incredible work. Um, where you track these values and you can you can change a thread's deadline based on these frequencies that you observe. And so this actually works really well and hopefully we'll be able to see the video at the end. Um, why does this work well? Well, like many things in computing, it's Amdahl's law, right? On the top here, let's say this is this is a, a loop, like this is our frame. And the first half of it, the first 50% is being run by like a million threads and the second 50% is being run by a single thread. Well, even though like a CPU profiler might tell you that the first half is extremely hot and like it's a million times more CPU than the second half, of course, in reality, if you optimize either parts of these, you're going to get the same, like if you, if you optimize either side by 50%, you're going to get a 33% boost, right? And so that's an important way of thinking about things in parallel computing that's, you know, not necessarily like what would first occur if it's a, you know, yeah, it's a parallel thing. So we really want to boost work chains because the theory, the theory right, is these games are highly pipelined. You have... GNOME is waking up X-Wayland, is waking up Terraria, is waking up its friends, is finally waking up the main thread. Like, every piece of this is part of the whole frame pipeline. And if we can accelerate any of these things, then Amdahl's law tells us that the frame is going to be rendered much more quickly. Everywhere is the bottleneck in a work chain. And yep, here we go. So exactly what I just said. There's, you know, there's bidirectionality here, as we saw, but the bidirectionality is still serialized for most of this. Okay, so can you, can you lower the lights in the front one more time, Erwan? Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Oh yeah. Sorry. You just have the one on me. Nice. Okay. So we're starting on an idle system. Everything is fine. Can you see that? Okay. Great. Thank you. So now we're gonna kick off stress ng. And yeah, there you go. It's, it doesn't perform well. And then we're gonna kick off SCX Rusty. And it goes right back to where it was, and then the sun comes out. Actually, literally, that was I didn't plan that, but I'll take it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, no lag at all. And then, of course, if we kill Rusty and we go back to EVDF, um, you start to see the lag is happening again. Pretty straightforward, right? Pretty pretty clear, at least I should say. Okay, so oh, I don't want, yeah. So what's going on? We can collect a trace again, um, and well, it's exactly what we know, right? Seven, still having these 16.7 millisecond periodic cadences. But now Terraria main, which is the tail of that, that frame, is done rendering well before GNOME starts again, the GNOME shell. So that's why, that's why there's no lag. That's, that's again, how, how like, interactive workloads work. Um, now, of course, it's not perfect, right? Like, if we look at the trace, X Wayland here is blocked for a millisecond, and it ran for 23 microseconds. And so that's a long time to be blocked if you're running for a teeny amount of time. So there, there are definitely things we could be doing better. Um, I want to talk about those briefly. Oh, I'm actually running way under time. Okay. So what can we do to try to improve, you know, further improve? Because there's a lot of other things. Um, so one idea that I think we could consider is boosting priority inheritance. In the example with Terraria, there's a ton of wake-ups, right? Like Terraria main is, is, is boosting a lot between talking to X Wayland and everything like that. It's waking up a bunch of its buddies. So this is like a workload that's really well suited for what we were just looking at. But there are also other workloads where like the main thread might have one wake up per frame or one or two or something and it's chewing on the CPU. Like um, Rocket League is like that. Um, and I was like, what the heck? Why is this like not working at all? And it turns out that's why, because it, uh, it, it actually does hog the CPU. It's part of a work chain, but it's, you know, you, you can't just scale everything like through the roof either uh, for these frequencies, right? So we, we might have to think of like having like, oh, we know that you're really supposed to be boosted. And if you wake up somebody else, or if somebody is woken up by you who is in your work chain, then we'll just let you inherit their boost. Might not work in every scenario, but something to consider. Um, another thing that's a big project that I think has a lot of potential in general beyond even inter interactivity is cooperative scheduling. So for runtime frameworks, for example, like uh, like Folly and Meta or, uh, or Go or whatever, um, you could have a runtime framework that understands what user space needs, right? Like you're scheduling user space may say, hey, here are my frames, I want you to render them. And then another process says, I'm rendering a compile workload, I don't care, this is low priority. And then those runtimes could communicate their, their quality of service down to the scheduler, and the scheduler could boost accordingly. So that's probably the most robust approach, but of course it requires user space uh, collaboration, so it's not necessarily ideal. Um, 
Another idea is grouping work chains in C groups, or in general, looking at work chains as sort of a single unit as opposed to the individual threads that are in a work chain. That's sort of priority inheritance, right? If you're inheriting your priority inheritance based on who's in your work chain, it's kind of the same idea. But I think you also want to look at the length of entire work chains. And specifically for something, Mathieu, do you have a question? Uh, I'm curious about the way you compute um, the runtime. So in the prior uh, idea where you, be, I guess, is it the average runtime for the tasks? Oh, so like in the idea that we actually implemented, not the, yeah, so in, in SCEDX, there, there are um, callbacks that you, can, that you can hook into when a thread starts running on the CPU and when they stop running. So you just track that. So it's Is super that an easy. average that you use? It's, it's, no, so yeah, so you track it for that one run, and then they're, they're one of the data, BPF data structures you can use is per task storage. So you can store the average on there and then can, and like have a moving average, essentially, um, that you update every time the thread runs. To okay, uh, we should discuss more about tracking distributions. Because if you have like a binomial or something that's, that yeah, you're yeah. not aiming at the sing single thing, it might be important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That would be, that's for sure, that would be an improvement, yeah. Cool, yeah, good question. Um, and so, yeah, you know, th that's the idea. Boost, boosting, looking at work chains is essentially like an individual scheduling entity as opposed to the tasks inside them. And so um, for VR especially, where we have like a lot of really high fidelity work, uh, work chains where like you're getting uh, data input at really high hertz, um, uh, and it's not just like one pipeline that you really want to boost, something like this might be good to kind of distinguish priorities um, between these work chains. Okay, so in terms of current status and future plans, uh, I was going to have this slide say that we sent the latest PR, but it was actually merged on Saturday night, which is awesome. Uh, I was super happy that it happened actually while we were in Paris for kernel recipes. I don't think that could have scripted that better. So really, really happy about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, I, I do want to say that I think KR helped because I've had a lot of conversations with people that were in the decision-making pipeline uh, for SCEDEX that happened at this conference, so shout out to KR as well. Um, and th this is the PR, you know, whatever, beep, bloop, bloop, I'll probably frame it, I think it's kind of cool. Um, okay, so upcoming features. Um, so one of the interesting things that I think has a lot of potential as well is hierarchical C group scheduling. And what I mean by that is you could imagine potentially, because the C group V2 hierarchy is, is, is unified, it's global, you could attach schedulers at individual C groups and then the job of a scheduler in a C group could be either to call into a subgroup or to, um, like to iterate over the C groups like you do in the main scheduler or decide, okay, this C group is the one that I want to give the CPU to. I'll call into its scheduler and then it'll decide in its subgroup who gets to use the CPU next. So for example, like if you had schedulers attached to processes, individual like leaf C groups, then you could decide, you could let that, that process schedule itself. And so that could be like an alternative to UMCG um, uh, which, which also worked really well, but just in general, like these in-process schedulers, that's one way that we could potentially implement it. Um, upcoming features as well, you know, there's always just like tons of new ideas, new schedulers that are being worked on. Um, we, have, we have the kernel repo, which is, a, which is uh, Tajian's repo in kernel.org, which you can, of course, take a look at. And then we have a GitHub repo called uh, SCX, which has all of the actual SCEDX schedulers themselves. Of course, both of these are GPL v2. Um, but a lot, these, this is this, the, the SCX repo with the schedulers is super active, so... A lot of stuff to see there. Um, the documentation is in tree, so you can take a look. Just documentation, scheduler, subdirectory. The V12 patch set uh, is here. And we have a, a Slack channel that you can always join, that you can talk to us directly if you have questions or you want to get involved with the project. Um, we're, we're very active on there, too, so feel free to join us. And I think that was it. Yeah. So you were showing like compiling or running stress in G1 gaming, but gamers usually don't do that. So do you know what would be the improvement between switching scheduler for a system that is not overloaded? Well, so, so yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, you, you mean, some people do unfortunately run compile jobs, but in general, um, having something like this is really good for like P99 FPS more than anything. So with something like the Steam Deck where, you know, it's, I forget how many cores, I think it's six. Um, the, like there's background threads running, there's telemetry, right? And so you really want to make sure that when the system does have these spiky moments, you don't get any kind of artifacts in the end user's experience. Um, but yeah, so typically, of course, yeah, you're not like overloading with 8x, but it's just an easy way to show the, the, the potential of the idea. Yeah. Okay. And do you know if um, 
uh, the Windows kernel does that, or out, out where, are we at a point where Linux can have faster FPA than Windows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it depends. Like, I don't think, I think if you threw, like, an 8x background job at, like, at Windows while you were playing a game, I don't think it would, I've never tried it, I don't think it would do too well. Now, the thing is, so, Windows does some things much better than Linux. Like, for example, there's um, one of the new AMD chips uh, has a vCache. So, yeah, there's two CCXs. For those of you who don't know, there's two L3 caches on the same Numa node. And one of them has a, a, a cache sitting on top of the, the CCX. And so that one, that, that L3 cache has better cache locality and better memory locality. But the other one is better CPU frequency because the one with the cache sitting on top traps heat. So you have to throttle that one. You have to do thermal throttling. And so that is a crazy scheduling problem that like Linux hasn't even begin to, begun to think about. And on those chips, Windows like destroys Linux. Um, but that's an opportunity for improvement. I mean, we certainly could implement that with SCEDEX. So yeah, great question. Um, in the example you have shown, you had um, your game running, and then you started random stress and details, which basically computed for the CPU time with the game, right? Correct. Wouldn't it work for, um, that you boost an RT priority to the game and leave these get other tasks as is? <laughs> so, yeah, you could use RT, and actually there are... No, no, like, no, no. Oh. You don't need RT for that. We have those priorities since ages. Well, CFS doesn't have priorities, right? Yes, it does. SCED FIFO. SCED FIFO is RT. Yeah, but you don't need preempt RT for it. It is an RT priority. No, it is. SCED FIFO and SCED RR are both RT class. Yes. They're always strictly above CFS. But it works without preempt RT. It's an RT priority. But would well, it work it always, for you? It always, so, okay, so you could, you could give it the SCED FIFO SCED class, and it would always run at a higher priority than the, the background jobs, correct? But right. that doesn't really scale, right? Like, what if you have gears running here, you have YouTube open, you have like data pipelines coming in from sensor devices, like everybody is going to think that they need to have like real-time priority. So we actually have, we have, one of the big problems that we're running into on our, our VR headsets is that like the whole system essentially is RT. And it becomes this game of whack-a-mole where this person's priority was a little bit high, or like for example, Unity has spin locks in user space where they sked yield in the spin lock, and now if you're using RT, you're just spinning in the spin lock and repeatedly going back up into, into user space and doing nothing, right? So I think y you could fix latency with RT, but it's not a great solution. Um, and RT in general just kind of circumvents like the whole resource management pipeline in the system, right? So you don't really want to do that. So first I have to apologize for missing your entire talk. The um, reason why was Paul and I were actually, at, Paul McKinney and I were outside arguing over SCEDEX. Uh, well, it's too late. I already got merged, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> but one of the things that we were talking about, which I want to bring up and actually ask your opponent, because I'm, is one thing I want to work on is scheduling governors. And I think we talked about this before. So the idea is actually in C to be able to, instead of like having the one size fit all gov uh, uh, scheduler, have a way of having maybe a server governor, a desktop governor, and a embedded governor. And one thing I would do is take the existing scheduler, move it into the um, server governor, take like the MUX scheduler or something as the baseline for, if everyone doesn't know, that's Khan's uh, latest scheduler, uh, into like the desktop scheduler or, and maybe have embedded folks figure out whatever thing else. The point of SCEDEX to me is, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate. I actually agree with Thomas Gleichner when he said SCEDEX is a toy because I really do believe that as a, I know it works really well and stuff like that, but to me, my fear is that SCEDEX will become, you know, everyone's little, you know, you have a governor or you have a scheduler, you have a scheduler, you have a scheduler, everyone have a scheduler, but to, uh, to get motivation for collaboration, if we actually had governors, and SCEDEX would be great to say, hey, I did a tweak to this governor, pass the SCEDEX program around to everyone, so everyone says, hey, no regressions. We implement it to see. Wash, rinse, re uh, repeat. What are your thoughts? What, 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 I mean, one of the hopes of SCEDEX is that it provides a way to do a quick experimentation, right? Which will yeah. be merged back to the default, to the, to the default scheduler. Like, as far as like, having scheduler governors versus like, a pluggable scheduling framework, honestly, I don't, I don't know if I want to debate that. I think... Like, there's, a, there's pros and cons to all these approaches, right? I think SCEDEX works really well for meta and production. We're running it on millions of hosts. It works well for Steam Deck. They're going to be running it in prod. I can certainly understand the sentiment that it's not, like, meant to be run in production. It can be. But, um, yeah, I think, I think regardless of whether we go with, like, a SCEDEX is the way that you run these things or you have a SCED governor approach or you have, like, a VFS type of thing with schedulers, 
this it, it is used like the intention of using it to experiment and merge changes to the default kernel is absolutely there and it's it's always been there. So right. hopefully that's what it'll be used for regardless of how the pluggable part gets. So done. basically, like I said, I like the fact that the um, what's it called of Skedex of doing that, but the, my fear of like. I'll throw out this question that Paul kind of mentioned I should have done to Tijin, uh, was how many different Skedex uh, programs are out there in Meta? Uh, well, we're only running one in production right now. Oh, only one? Oh, it's only one, I was saying. We're running the XCX layered one that lets you specify policies, but the, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, so the idea, as we talked already with, with Steve, like the idea of govern, scheduling governors doesn't exclude uh, necessarily uh, Skedex. We can have both, uh, and, I mean, people can still do experiments with, with the BPF scheduling and whatnot. Uh, if we find something that works great in general, we can just merge them in the, the governor idea. And still having the, the governor is, is something that is compatible with having the SCADEX infrastructure. So that's probably the ideal plan for the future. Like, yeah. Anything else? Break time, cool, thank you.